Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. This is day two of our two-day conference through the Kentucky Council on Problem Gambling for addiction, our yearly uh, education and awareness uh, conference. My name is Jeremy Kiefer. I'm the program evaluator for River Valley Behavioral Health. I'm also a board member with the Kentucky Council on Problem Gambling. Our first speaker this morning, uh, she asked me if I could introduce her, which is a great pleasure for me. And then she handed me a page long introduction with things that she's done and certifications and told me to make that short. So I'm going to do my best. Dr. Ronsalyn Clark is the clinical director of the Bolware Treatment Program in Owensboro, where she implemented the first gambling treatment program in Kentucky. Prior to this, she was the Senior Director of Prevention and Substance Use Disorder Services for River Valley Behavioral Health, where I had the pleasure of getting to meet her almost 10, 13 years ago today. She holds a vast array of licenses, degrees, and certifications. She holds a doctorate in psychology. She is a nationally certified counselor, and she was the first woman in Kentucky to become a certified compulsive gambling counselor. She has accumulated over 32 years of experience and put up with me for 13 of them. <laughs> she has spoken and been the recipient of a wide number of awards at the local, state, and federal levels. Most recently, the 2012 Robert Strauss Award for Lifetime Achievement in Substance Abuse and the BPNW Davis County Woman of Achievement. Her work with River Valley Programs has been recognized at the national level for best practices six times. Beside all of this, as if that weren't enough, she continues to be an active voice and advocate for those in need through her work as an instructor and a certification specialist. She works on several boards and committees, such as the Kentucky Council on Problem Gambling and the National Council on Problem Gambling. This morning, she will be presenting on Problem Gambling 101. So without further ado, it is with my great honor and deep pleasure to introduce our first speaker this morning, someone who is not just a mentor to me, but an advocate, a peer, and a friend, Dr. Ronsalyn Clark. Jeremy, thank you. I wish you'd shortened it a lot more than that. I did. <laughs> and it wasn't a page either. I've got a few housekeeping uh, things that Mike asked me to announce for anybody that's new today that was not here yesterday. The first thing is bathrooms are around the corner. Um, we'll take a break after you get tired of hearing me, which might be pretty soon. Uh, for the people that are virtual, uh, you will be receiving an email next week with your evaluation. You are to complete on each class that you attended. Every time you complete an evaluation per class, that's how they'll determine your hours. So you're kind of on your honor system there. Um, uh, local attendees will also be getting an e evaluation email next week. And for local folks, if you want to ask a question, uh, please make sure to come to the podium and ask the questions. These, um, your face will not be shown. I said, maybe their camera's shine. Don't want to, don't want to be up there, but your face will not be shown uh, to anybody but the uh, virtual people. So, and I don't even know who they are. I don't even know how many there are. Anyway, I am going to be talking today about Gambling 101. We haven't had Gambling 101 in several years, and I haven't taught it in more than that. And it was interesting because I decided I wanted to prepare some different things for this uh, presentation today. And I look back at the last one that I had done, which was about nine or 10 years ago, and how the research has changed in that period of time. So you're gonna hear some new material, even though this is Gambling 101. I know in this audience we have some people that have been doing this work for a long time. So just bear with me um, and add to anything that I have to say. But I also look out in this audience and know that there are some brand new folks 
that have not had any of this training before. And hopefully this will be some very interesting information and pique your interest in getting yourself further advanced in working with um, gambling, uh, with disordered gamblers. So without further ado, I'm sorry this screen does not look as pretty because I really like doing this PowerPoint. It's just all the prettiest colors, but it's not showing up real well up here. Okay, approximately 85% of individuals gamble of our population. And of that, we've had about 60% that have gambled in the last year. What exactly is gambling? Well, it's to wager money or something that you have of value on an uncertain outcome in hopes of obtaining something of greater value. You may be wagering money to get more money. And I say this every time I do one of these presentations. For the, for the addicted gambler, this is not about winning money. This is about staying in the game. It's not how much money can I get today and take home and pay bills, buy things, whatever. It's about the money is the vehicle to keep you in the game. We estimate that somewhere between one and 2% of individuals have a disordered gambling problem and another two to 3% are at risk for having disordered gambling problems. When we look at those individuals with gambling disorders, we have to always consider their accessibility and availability. Is there a gambling venue within 30 to 50 miles of where they live? That used to be a real important question. I would ask them, where do you go? I still ask, where do you go? How, what is your means of gambling? But right now, gambling is accessible in your own home. All you have to do is pick up this thing, and there it is. It doesn't matter how many times you go on to some kind of site. You're, most of the time, there's going to be some kind of gambling site that picks up and, and hits on what you're doing. You just can't escape it. Gambling has evolved, and I'm going to talk in just a minute about the history of gambling. Gambling has evolved in the last 10 years or so. Most gambling now, we do see a lot that visit the venues, horse racing tracks, casinos, but more and more gambling now is taking place in anonymous areas using this thing or your personal computer. And it is very asocial. You're not engaging with others, except for teenagers who will end up chatting with others who are on gambling sites with them. We see a lot of that that happens with the asocial gambling. Gambling is also turned into a source of public revenue. If you were to open yesterday's local newspaper, the headlines on the front page were about the sports betting, sports gambling. And eventually that's going to pass, I think. And when it does, that's going to be extra money that goes into the public, to you, to the, to the state uh, funds to use for whatever they deem that it would be appropriate. We hope and pray that some of that money will come to our council so that we can provide treatment and education and prevention activities for those that, that are in need of, of this. While it's a short-term relief to get that money to come into the state, it also creates long-term problems. So gambling is not the answer to moving ahead with your state funding. This is not working real well, Shane. Thank you. I'm going to give a shout out to Judge Tom Castlin, who provided the picture of this 
very, very old set of dice. I hope that is not a trigger to anyone in here. But I told him that I was going to use his picture. He put it on Facebook, and I just jumped all over that. These are actual dice <clears throat> that were around um, from about 3000 BC, a picture of those dice. That's where we have our first written, uh, our first record of any kind of gambling taking place. Uh, I love the story of how the, the hunters would go out with, um, to hunt for the day, and then they would gamble for the night's take home of whatever the meat was that they, they shot and killed with their arrows or however they killed it. And they would take sheet bones, round off the edges of the, the ankle bones, and make the dice that they would throw. So this is actual dice that they used then. I'm not sure if that's sheet bones, but it's actual dice from way back when. There's a book called Roll the Bones, which is all about the history of uh, gambling. Gambling predates the written language. We have uh, cave hieroglyphics showing uh, activities involving gambling. I said this was in Mesopotamia around 3000 BC. We have records uh, moving forward to 2500 BC. And this one just hurt my heart when I, when I was researching it. Those records indicate animal fighting. So animal fighting's been around a very long time. They also had dice, which by this time had left the Mesopotamia uh, area and had gone into China. By 1500 BC, we had multiple gambling houses in China. 900 AD, we were playing cards in China. By 1200 AD, we had lotteries and we had dominoes. Let's move a little bit into our United States. The gold rush days, most towns had one to two gambling houses. And I always think about the Old West and think about Gunsmoke and Miss Kitty in her saloon and all those people sitting there playing poker. They were playing poker and they were drinking. And a, along came a gentleman at that point in time that said he had a cure for gambling. And, you know, some of those gamblers that were sitting at those tables probably didn't want to go home and tell the little lady that they were gambling. And so they would go out back with this guy with his cure for gambling, and his cure was to stick their hands in a bucket of hot coals. Now, I guess that burned your hand so you couldn't hold the cards to play poker anymore, but I don't think it was a long-term cure for much. Our first casino in the United States opened in 1822 in New Orleans. In 1829, we discovered Las Vegas. In this middle of the desert, they named it Las Vegas, which is Spanish for the meadows. And I've been to Las Vegas. I imagine many of you also have been there. It doesn't look pretty like you see cows and flowers growing along the meadows. It's nothing like that. Um, let me back up a little bit. Our Revolutionary War was funded on lotteries that we had in, in our country at the time. We also had a lot of lotteries um, that started various colleges. Dartmouth is one. George Washington was a huge bookmaker. It's been written in some instances that he took about 40% off of every book that was done with him. So he was getting rich off of uh, of gambling. We move into the 1920s and we know we had prohibition happening then. At that point in time, gambling was more popular than alcohol. And by 1979, we fast forward pretty well. We had our first Native American casinos and this was the Seminole tribe in Florida. Then we get into the 2000s. In 2011, Bitcoin and my friend Jeremy has tried to explain that to me, and I think my brain's just a little too old to understand all of that. But Bitcoin came about, and by the mid-2000s, 2010 area, uh, era, we also had the emergence of esports. So gambling grows astronomically throughout our history, as well as when we talk about how much money has been spent on gambling. 
Nearly $53 billion was spent on gambling in 2021. It's estimated that by 2028, that number will go to $7.6 billion. And that is both legal and illegal gambling. 2022, we began to have that recession, yet it was reportedly the highest rate of money spent on gambling to date. And I don't have that number, but it's supposedly the highest amount we've had. Um, if you pick up today's local newspaper, the next two things that I talk about COVID, they quoted me in there in an article they did. Online gambling increased post-COVID from 62 to 76%. I believe that's very, very, very large. That's 14% increase. And in-person gambling went from 23 to 32 post-COVID. The average Las Vegas gambler spent a little over $700 in 21, and that was during COVID. When I had done this Gambling 101 presentation eight, nine years ago, that statistic was in the $500 range. So look how much more is being spent. The main things that we see driving gambling at this point are consumer interest in betting. Consumers like to bet, and they like to bet with their smartphones and on their computer. And that's not looking like it's going to change. And the increased potential and penetration for the internet has just made this be much, much more uh, available, much more appealing. I would, I, you know, people would rather sit in their pajamas at 2 a.m. than have to be dressed in at a casino. Lifetime problem gamblers, like I said, was anywhere one to two percent that are disordered gamblers, um, at-risk problem gamblers, another two to three percent. I'm going to talk some a little bit later this morning about some special populations, but I want to mention 10 percent or so of our veterans, United States veterans, are gamblers. That's pretty high. College students, we're looking at around six percent, higher than the national average for other adults. This is kind of good for us to know this next statistic, and that's about a third of the people that have a problem, either at risk or have disordered gambling, will have a natural remission from gambling. They will stop on their own at some point. And that is usually many years into their gambling career that they will stop. However, you heard this yesterday, you're going to hear it again today. And if you hear it every day and you, it just gets pounded into you, that's where I want it to be. You have to consider the suicide rates and how, the, how those suicide rates are. If I'm going to naturally go into some kind of remission from my gambling problem at 50, but I'm in some real trouble at 35, there's not a guarantee that I'm going to make it from that age to 50. So we can't just sit around and wait for this natural remission to happen in about a third of them. And sadly, only about 8% of gamblers seek help. And that help seeking takes many years. And I would say it correlates along the lines of what substance abuse takes. And in teaching mental health first aid, we say on an average it's about 20 years for someone to seek help for substance abuse. Depending on the financial losses and how quickly that gambler goes down, it may be much shorter than that before they are seeking help, but it could take a very long, long period of time. Gamblers Anonymous, GA, estimates that up to one third of their members would also qualify to our, our Gamblers Anonymous says that up to one third of Alcoholics Anonymous members would also qualify to be in that fellowship. So I go to an AA meeting and I would ask, raise your hands, I know I can't do this, but if I could, I would ask, raise your hands if you have a problem with gambling and we're looking at a third of that population that would raise their hands. I 
did this the other day in my treatment group and I uh, had, I believe, 18 men in there. All we treat um, residentially is eight, eight is men. So of the 18 men that I had in group, I said, who has a problem with gambling? And I had nine, 50%. I've done some work out at the Davis County Detention Center with Lee and we'll be back out there again um, soon to do some more work out there. And Lee's interested in getting her certification and she's like, where am I gonna get my folks? And I said, you've got, it. You've got the easiest job of everybody. You don't have to find them, they're right there. You've got a captured uh, audience full of gamblers. Um, and it's estimated that gamblers will have a direct effect on anywhere from five to 30 other people. And if you think about that, that's, that's pretty true. It it's affects their entire family it affects their friends, it affects their extended circles around them, um, usually in very negative ways, much like what a substance abuser does. With gambling is a great, has a great significance towards public health. What are we talking about with this? What's well, this whole list of things that I've got up here and it kind of piggybacks on what um, Dr. Fong said yesterday. Gambling is associated with high rates of divorce, domestic violence, and I will touch on that in a little bit, and child abuse, whether it's because the tension in the home is so, so strong because of the gambling behaviors, or you've probably all heard of instances where they take the kids and leave them in the car while the parents are in the casino, and you know that's child abuse. It is also associated with poor health. Dr. Fong mentioned the sleep deprivation um, and the stress hormones. I know in my heart, I helped someone prevent, many years ago I had an older man, I helped him prevent having a heart attack. He came to me, he did not look good, physically did not look good, had been gambling nonstop for several days. Kind of, if you, if you deal with methamphetamine acts, it was a, a little bit like his meth, someone on a meth run. He had been gambling and, and losing money and problems at home. And I cut the session short. And I said, the first thing I want you to do when you walk out of here is go to a doctor. I said, I feel that strongly that you are that far into trouble with within your body systems. And he did, he followed my instructions and he went to an urgent care and they said, you're too serious, we gotta get you to the hospital. They got him to the hospital and they said he was on the verge of, of having serious heart things happen. Um, and I'm not saying that because I was some kind of great savior to him, but we, when you're dealing with older people in particular or some that have got super, super stress, with the financial stuff and the family things that are happening, you've got to look at their health needs. I think it's an excellent idea, like Dr. Fong said, to give them some kind of a survey when they come into your mental health clinic or your setting, give them some kind of a health survey to see what's happening with them. <coughs> mental health goes hand in hand with gambling and with this we're talking depression, anxiety and increased rates of substance use. Financially lost wages, lost jobs, they're not paying taxes, white collar crimes. Whenever I hear somebody has embezzled something from particularly like a nonprofit because I've treated several gamblers that have done that, I immediately think, why do they need that $150,000 all of a sudden for something? Or when there's strange shoplifting crimes that get reported. And more often than not, it has something to do with, with gambling that's going on. Incarceration, they're usually gonna get incarcerated not because of gambling, but because of stealing or embezzling or, or whatever other crimes, financial kind of crimes are connected with it. And again, the rate of suicide that is so very high in what we see. This is the DSM-5 criteria. Um, I'm not gonna go through each of them. Four to five out of the nine um, gives you a mild gambling diagnosis. Six to seven gives you a moderate diagnosis. And 
uh, eight or nine, you have a severe diagnosis. As a clinician, I challenge you when you're seeing these individuals in your practice, ask them, ask yourself, is this person experiencing a, gam experiencing a gambling problem to the extent they need to have someone work with them? I would doubt very seriously you're going to see people with four and five may not even see a lot with six and seven. If they're coming to see you, they're going to be eight or nine. They're going to have a high number on there. Of all the gamblers I've treated, and I have actively been treating them for over 20 years, I have never had someone that was less than moderate that I can think of in everybody else, a majority, vast majority, 99%, if not 100 would be severe disorder. One of the things unique to gambling, kind of like it is substance abuse, is the lies that people tell. And that, those lies are their uh, efforts at maintaining the ability to stay in the action or stay in the escape. The activity of gambling would provide. And there's three kinds of lies that these individuals will tell you. Number one is the lies of omission. And that is the active use of passive or misleading statements. Something like, you didn't ask, so I didn't say. You didn't ask me if I went to the casino, so I didn't volunteer that I did. Then there's lies of commission, and that is out and out giving false statements. No, I didn't go to the casino. And the last kind of lie is a lie of distortion, where they recall the facts very differently. The ability to stay in the action of gambling for an, a gambling addict is held by someone who is lying, cheating, and stealing. They have to do those things in order to stay in the action. Gambling amongst our youth, I know we've got some people in here that work with youth and with our elderly is increasing. The largest percentage of Las Vegas visitors was over the age of 65. The busiest days in the casino are on the third and the fifth of the month when most people are getting their checks. If you walk into a casino, you're going to see a lot of older people. I think it's very sad that that is a major form of entertainment for our older people. I'm gonna talk some about youth coming up, uh, but that is a increasing population. And they hit this thing with suicide again Suicide is the second leading cause of death amongst our youth. And you put gambling addiction in there with that and your youth are gonna be in trouble. A lot of them can be in trouble very quickly. Uh, we had a presenter three or four conferences ago and she came from Chicago. and She had worked a lot with prevention and she also worked in treatment with youth. And she said it was common for her youth 15, 16, 17 year olds with large amounts of debt in the, in the you know, six, seven, eight, ten thousand dollars in debt when you're 17. I can't imagine. You say, how do they get that kind of money? Stealing mom's money, getting into debit cards, applying for credit cards. It's not hard to come up with money. Not hard at all. The average debt for a male gambler is somewhere fifty to ninety thousand um, dollars. I would say probably about the highest that I have had with a male gambler is about one hundred and seventy-five thousand that they were in debt. The average debt of a female gambler is fifteen thousand or less. I had one lady that I worked with for six or eight years, and her gambling debt ran right around a thousand dollars and most of us would look at that and say well you can pay that off you know pretty quickly 
but she never could seem to get it together to pay that off. She had some uh, payday loan places and she had some high interest credit cards. At one point she inherited uh, from a family member who passed, she inherited about $75,000. Now most of us would say, let's pay the debt off. That's rational thinking. Her rational thinking is I'm going to buy a $50,000 car, which she did, and that lasted about two months before she took it back because she could no longer afford it. And she took family members and extended family members to the tune of about 25 people for a week at Disney. That's why she couldn't pay that $1,000 off. I mean, obviously we had a lot of mental health things going on with her as well. But that gambling debt, um, she ended up having a difference in insurance and I could no longer see her. I, I bet that... <laughs> Uh, that gambling debt is most likely still there. Here's another one I want you, my colleagues that are clinicians to hear. 30% of all gamblers have already been in your office. 30% of those with mental health disorders have been in your office. You're not screening for them, you're not assessing for it, you're not asking. And if you are, it's going by really quickly when you ask those questions and you're not digging deep. And I realize we have limited amounts of time with individuals, but if all you ask is those lie back questions, and we've got that up here um, over on the, the last thing. Uh, what are those things? I told, I told some people I, I fell in December and I had a concussion and sometimes words escape me, so I'm very sorry about that. But Banner, that's good. Thank you, Jeremy. I knew you would rescue me. But if you ask only two or three questions as a screener, it's real easy to get yes, no answers and move on. So I challenge you to do a better job of that. And, that, and you know, I'm guilty of doing that as well. Um, a couple of definitions on here. I've thrown out some terms that I was trained using and trying to get away from. We don't say gambling addict. We don't say pathological gambling anymore or pathological gambler. We don't say compulsive gambler. We try to stick with disordered because it's a disorder or someone living with a gambling disorder. Um, and then because I think it's kind of cool, Ludopathy or ludomania is the original word for gambling. Um, and I think that's just a cool word. Remember, it's about staying in the game. It's not about the money. We don't need to stigmatize individuals with mental health disorders any more than we already have, and they've stigmatized themselves. So let's be person-centered with using our language. The high is very similar to that of substance abuse. It's about being in the action. Being in the action produces the dopamines. These dopamines numb and they help you escape most likely developmental holes that are, are, have happened in your, in your life. They also can be stimulating. That also fills those developmental holes that have happened in your life. You get a big win, that produces lots and lots of feel-good chemicals, and you're off and running. But all good things that go up must come down. You know, you're gonna have a big win, but you're not gonna consistently have big wins. And when you start coming down, then you get into chasing your losses. By the time a gambler is chasing losses, they are into some trouble. Even if they're not in legal trouble, they are in financial trouble and they are probably into some problems within their family. It's like working with substance abuse when you have to take and look at those developmental holes. That's why we talk about so many similarities and differences to substance abuse. Similarities, 
the inability to stop. Denial is embedded very deeply. Preoccupation. Looking forward to the weekend when you can go gamble. Looking forward to getting off from work when you can go gamble. I had one that uh, I was seeing him in person during uh, COVID and he would go to Evansville to the casino three to four times a week when they opened the casino back up. Plus what he was doing on the phone with the bookie. Preoccupation. When I would see him, he would tell me, I can't wait till tomorrow when I can go back over there. Withdrawal. And you may say, what? You have withdrawal with gambling? Yes, you do. Most gamblers will have some um, signs of irritability, restlessness, discontent, may have some intestinal issues a week or so after they have stopped going to a gambling uh, venue. So there is some withdrawal. The disease has phases and it progresses. Similarities to substance abuse. Both individuals, the gambler and the uh, person living with drug abuse, chase highs. Both have euphoric recall. Both use it as an escape from pain. <clears throat> and if you were to put brain scans side by side between users of, of drugs and those who are gamblers getting ready to, to bet, these brain scans will look very similar. They share unique characteristics of secrecy, shame, and swiftness. Some differences. Gamblers will physically look good until they're near bottom, until they nearly hit bottom. Substance abusers start to look bad shortly after they start using. The gambling family may not be aware for some time that the person is gambling, whereas if you're living with a substance user, you know pretty soon. Gambling is the only addiction where individuals can be successful at times. It is more easily hidden there is no urine drug screen or any other kind of test you can do with a gambler. You can't say, here, go in this cup and know that they're gambling. There are way fewer resources. I don't know how many substance abuse clinicians there are in the state of Kentucky. Mm, I'm going to say maybe 500 across Kentucky, you ever take a hundred or so? Anybody know how many gambling clinicians we have in Kentucky that actively practice? Actively practicing? Five. The, the way suicide happens is, is different. Um, death comes from the use of the drug you're going to overdose. Death associated with gambling comes from the suicide. You're not going to die from playing cards. You usually are much older when you die because of gambling than you are because of substance use. The role of money in both, I think, t is tied to self-esteem, especially if you look at people who both sell substances and use substances. Gambling tends to have higher relapse rates. There's a low level of treatment seeking compared to drug addiction. You know, about 20% to 30% of individuals will at some point get do some drug treatment seeking. And I said 8% will do gambling, gambling secret 
uh, treatment seeking. Um, another similarity is the great amount of lying that happens between them as well. There's a high co-occurrence with gambling disorders and substance abuse, but also with eating disorders, smoking, and Dr. Fong touched on that yesterday, and sexual acting out, so sexual addiction. Do you see that a lot, Rob, with those that you're treating? Gambling and sexual addiction go hand in hand. Good. Not good for them, but good that that's showing, proven out. Disordered gamblers with frequent alcohol use have greater gambling severity and more psychosocial problems from relating from gambling than those without alcohol use disorders. And adolescents who are moderate to high frequency drinkers are more likely to gamble frequently than those who are not. High correlation then between alcohol and gambling. Um, research also suggests a positive correlation between methamphetamine use and disordered gambling. Probably because of the large amounts, amount of the dopamines that can be released. Gambling is also highly correlated with high ACE scores. I'm looking for Scott, he's not in here. Dr. Hunt and myself uh, interviewed a little over 100 women at the Davis County Detention Center regarding gambling behaviors and adverse childhood experience scores, and the correlation was extremely high. We had women that were running easily into the seven to eight range on saying yes to the ACE test. And this is one of those sad statistics here. Public funding for substance abuse is 281 times greater than it is for gambling. And in Kentucky, as you've been hearing the last day, it's, we have no public funding. All of our funding comes from industry who is acting responsibly saying we need to be, we're part of this, we want to be partners with the treatment and recovery folks and we believe in what you do and we will help support what you do. Gambling and mental health, 24, 20 to 40% of those who gamble will at some point in time have, a suicidal, have suicidal thoughts. When you're screening them in your offices, you need to ask about those with anxiety. And if you're seeing gamblers with high anxiety, those are the ones that you probably need to be the most concerned about. Approximately 40 to 50% of individuals who engage in problem gambling also meet the criteria for depressive disorders. Depressive symptoms have been shown to predict the onset of gambling behaviors. And people who engage in problem gambling and have depression are more likely to report greater severity of problems associated with gambling, history of childhood abuse and neglect. We're gonna revisit neglect in a little bit, but childhood neglect is large in this population. That's kind of, if you hear neglect, you need to hmm, explore that a little bit further. Lower family functioning, lower levels of extroversion, lower levels of agreeableness and conscientiousness. What we know with, with some of the major disorders, mental health disorders, 60% of gamblers also have a personality disorder. A lot of that's gonna show up in antisocial personality disorder and a lot's gonna show up in, as my daughter, who is a therapist, would fuss at me for saying this one, borderline personality disorders. She's always correcting me and says, that's complex PTSD, mama. 75% will have alcohol use disorder, 40% will have a drug disorder, 60% will have nicotine disorders. 96% of individuals with a gambling disorder have more, one or more co-occurring disorder, 
and 60% will have over three. So you could have gambling disorder and three other diagnoses to go with it. This is one of several screenings that we have. Um, it is one that I like the best for screening. And when I went out to the detention center and worked with Lee and her folks, this is what I gave the guys out there. And we were talking yesterday, you had 40-ish guys when I was out there a few months ago, and well over half raised their hand that they had a problem meeting the criteria on here. This is a screening. I'm gonna to talk to you about assessment uh, as well. Other screening tools include the South Oaks. That's really old. When I was trained, that was the one I was trained on was the South Oaks Gambling Screen or the SOGS. That's based on DSM-3 criteria. And I remember in 1989 sitting in a graduate class and our professor was so excited because the DSM-3 had just come out. So it's old probably has some, still has some good use with the South Oaks, but it's not one that I'm, I have used years ago, but I don't use it anymore. There's one called the NODS, N-O-D-S, the LIBET, GA20 questions. You can always use the DSM-5 for a screening tool. The Brief bios gambling, Biosocial Gambling Screen. What do you guys use in Indiana? That's crazy. Until somebody's willing to spend the money to change the EMR, we're stuck with the SOG. I, I know when I've done supervision with Indiana people, they've talked about the brief biosocial. We asked them to do that and the SOG. SOG is for enrollment with payment, and brief biosocial is for the, the screening part. This is just a screener that's to, you know, say maybe we need to explore things further. Make sure when you're dealing with that person that you may be considering as a gambling, uh, with a gambling addiction, that you rule out anything associated with a manic episode. Look real closely at their stimulant use disorder because that could be affecting things. And always ask what their medications are. Because you're gonna run into people who are taking L-DOPA medications medications for Parkinson's disease or restless leg syndrome that can cause someone to suddenly present as someone with a gambling disorder. I've had that happen, I believe now four times. And two times when we found out, two times I know were uh, restless leg medications in particular they were on Mir Mirpex, I think, or Requip. It was one of those two. Two of those in indication, those, two of those instances with the physician's approval, the person stopped taking those medications and stopped gambling immediately. So you've got to look at those medications. I get kind of nervous when I see people coming through on Abilify because that's got some linkage as well. And then if you have clientele that have Parkinson's syndrome and they're on medications, definitely screen them for any kind of gambling that goes on. In addition to gambling, that seems to be the most when I talk about these medications, but going hand in hand with that would be sexual addictions and shopping addictions. I had one of my guys that was on restless leg had a serious suicide attempt and ended up in the hospital. And that was years ago before we really started looking at this. When we began looking at his medications, the doctor immediately said, that's what happened. It's this medication. So, you know, that needs to be a first day that you're interviewing them, that you check into that. When I began talking about Gambling 101, you know, years ago, I talked about escape gamblers and serious social gamblers and action gamblers. Our field has moved away from that and we have moved into the pathways model. And so for some of you, this may be some new material that you're getting. Um, 
but it's really, really pretty exciting. In 19, the late 1990s and first published in 2002 was Blazinski and Knower's uh, research looking at the pathways to addictive gambling. And they divided up gamblers into three specific types. Number one was the behaviorally conditioned problem gambler. If you're gonna treat gamblers, this is the one you want. These are the easier ones. Emotionally vulnerable gamblers. And then they came up with pathway number three, who is the emotionally vulnerable with antisocial. So that's a combination here. Each subtype of gambler can be influenced by different factors, yet they display very similar features, such as depression, substance use, impulsivity, and antisocial behaviors. Now I'm gonna recommend using their assessment if you're gonna look at this pathways model. It's very, very good. You can get their assessment online uh, for free. And their assessment is called the Gambling Pathways Questionnaire, or GPQ. And it will assess, it's 40 something questions. It will assess, and, and they can fill it out, or you can fill it out with them. Uh, for mood disorders, pre and post mood, pre gambling, post gambling mood, childhood abuse, Neglect, keyword there, neglect, and trauma. It'll look at their stress and coping and their motivation for change, impulsivity, risk taking, sexual risk taking, and antisocial traits, and behaviors. So let's take a little look into each of these. The behaviorally conditioned gambler. This person, and I've, I'm treating two right now who I, I believe would fall into this level. Begins at any age. Their exposure probably began by family members or by peers that maybe took them to a casino, took them to the racetrack. They began using gambling as a social or entertainment reason they believe in their heart they're more likely to win than they are to lose. Where we come up with the name behaviorally conditioned is that exposure, the going to the track, the casino, the convenience store to get the tickets or wherever they are, is that exposure of going to the venue or the exposure to what's online will create behavioral conditioning. Behavioral conditioning that we all learned in grad school. Then it's re related to reinforcement because every now and then you're going to get a win. So you learn that if you keep pressing the lever long enough, like the, the dogs did, Pavlov's dogs, eventually you're going to get a reward. There is magical thinking, as in most gamblers. They tend to be the least severe, like I said, the easiest to treat. They do engage in chasing their losses. I spoke with one just a few days ago that was, had relapsed and was chasing his loss. He'd lost about $500 and was chasing that loss. They gamble to achieve a sense of belonging, be part of the crowd. They gamble to combat loneliness, generate excitement, escape depression and anxiety. They do not have the high levels of anxiety and depression that the other subtypes will have. They have shorter periods of excess gambling. They're not there at whatever their type they're doing every day gambling something. Um, they generally had a stable childhood. They have pretty good healthy family history. Their substance use is minimal. To treat this kind, and, and I, I am glad we've got some treatment protocols for these, to treat the pathway one gambler, you need to use, Dr. Barrett, we need to use CBT. You gotta attack that magical thinking. 
You have to focus on realistic appraisal and breaking through their denial. You need to involve the family and any friends that are available. This is a group that you will teach coping skills to and dealing with stress. You will, every time you see them, you will conduct a lethality assessment. Second type is the emotionally vulnerable. Females tend to be higher in psychological distress, history of depression, anxiety, suicidal attempts. They tend to be older and have preference for slot machines. This is, they have similar scores to male counterpart gamblers in their impulsivity. 80% of emotionally vulnerable gamblers are over the age of 36. So they're gonna be a little older by the time you see them. The behaviorally conditioned can be any age, but you're probably gonna see them a little bit younger than that. They have strong histories of anxiety and depression. They have lots of negative events that have created developmental holes in their soul. They like to gamble to escape whatever is going on in their life. They have a history of poor coping skills, poor family backgrounds. They are often in need of additional substance use treatment. They are emotionally vulnerable to all addictions, both substance and behavioral process addictions. Gambling seems to modulate their affective states. They need a lot of psychological health help. They are probably going to need to be on medication for their anxiety and depression. They have a lot of personality things going on. This is where I'm gonna throw those complex PTSD folks in. The guys are much more risk-taking. The women are more sexually risk-taking. They can appear hyper at times, poor problem solving skills to treat them. Again, we're gonna look at CBT. We're going to have to heavily confront their denial. We're gonna to have to address the comorbidity with their substance use and mental health. These are some of the folks that would have that, when I mentioned co-occurring, maybe three or more diagnoses that's, that's hitting in here. You're going to have to treat their trauma. Remember in our first group, probably wasn't a whole lot of trauma that happened. These people are full of trauma. You're gonna to have to help them heal their losses and you're going to have to address their family issues. That means getting the family involved. And I would venture to say most of my substance abuse friends out here would agree getting family involved is not always easy. It's the same thing with gamblers. You need to evaluate for other addictive behaviors, other behavioral addictive behaviors, the compulsive sexual acting out, the shoplifting, the shopping, the eating disorders. Last thing, conduct lethality assessments. I don't care if you've got these folks in your treatment and you've been seeing them regularly for a year you need to always make sure they don't have a plan and they don't have means. It's just that important. That's one of the main reasons we started out yesterday morning with talking about suicide. Pathway three is two plus some more stuff. So all the traits of person at pathway two and then some. These are real big time risk takers and thrill seekers. Two thirds of our younger folks and I'm saying under 30 and, and even, you know, the teenage, the adolescents that are gambling, two thirds of those gamblers will fall into this category. They often lived, live on an almost daily uh, venture with substance use, rampant suicidal ideations. They have low, low boredom tolerance and a great percentage of them have been in jails. Rob, Teresa. Your kids, right here. Um, 
they have very early onset with gam problem gambling, sometimes as young as 10. Early history of family instability, abuse and neglect. High levels of antisocial behaviors, substance abuse. Most of them are ADHD. I am talking about y'all's kids, aren't I? Criminal behaviors. And they gamble for meaning or purpose to be somebody big in the group. Treatment for them involves CBT. If you haven't had a CBT class lately, I suggest you hit one up because if you're working with gamblers, it's very important. You need to confront their denial. You need to address the comorbidity with them. You need to address their narcissism. And that's always fun. Teach them coping skills, problem solving. They are going to need psychiatry help and they are probably going to need medications. Conduct a lethality assessment. So that's our three different pathways and I think that's just some real interesting stuff and good ways to look at, at our gamblers much better than we used to label them, categorize them as escape in action. It's much more advanced. Some things to talk about with treatment. Our goal is abstinence. Jeff and I had this discussion the other day. He said, you know, what about harm reduction? I'm gonna talk about it I on the next slide and I have tried harm reduction with some clients and it has always failed. Others of you may have tried it and you've had some success with, success with it. I did not. Um, socialization to Gamblers Anonymous. They need to understand what happens with GA. It's a little different than AA and NA. Mostly like that, but it, there are some differences. Need to deal with their coping skills in treatment. CBT is very, very good. Regardless of the pathway, one, two, or three, Sad news is about a third of, of disordered gamblers will leave treatment after about 30 days. So you may have seen them two to four times. Another two thirds will leave within 90 days. So at that point you've maybe, if you're lucky, had six or eight times. And pathways one and two, about 90% are done with you after about a year. I have had two clients over my recent years. You know, we've got the whole world is divided pre-COVID and post-COVID, I think. This was relatively close to COVID closing us down. I had two disordered gamblers that both stayed with me a little over a year. And that was like, wow, being able to keep that. Those, and they both had to travel with one of them traveled a little over an hour and the other one traveled nearly three hours to get to me. So that's, that's been kind of cool. Harm reduction methods. If you choose to gamble, do so for entertainment. Treat the money you lose as the cost of your entertainment. My entertainment on a weekend may be, you know, if you go out to dinner and, and go to a movie, you know, go to a concert or something, you're talking $100-ish not a thousand dollars most of us don't have a thousand dollars to blow on a weekend for entertainment if you do i want to know where you work <laughs> set dollar limits and stick to it uh, don't trade credit debit cards into any place put them different if you're gambling at home on your phone um, yesterday uh, someone mentioned gam ban I've been treating some sports gamblers lately and have had to use Gamban, which bans access to sites on your phone, and that has worked beautifully. Highly recommend it. Set a time limit that you're gonna be there. I tried one guy that was going almost daily. I, 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 we compromised three times a week for two hours, which was killing this abstinence girl here and he wasn't able to stick with it. Expect to lose. Uh, whatever you're taking, it's your fun, it's your entertainment for you know for Saturday night. Expect to not get it back. If I go to a movie and dinner, 
I'm not going to get that money back. So I expect to lose that money. If you're going to the casino or whatever, expect to lose it. Make it a rule not to gamble on credit, create balance. And I said, if you're going to go to the casino, because that's what he did was go to the casino two hours. He, you know, we tried the two hours three times a week. Then you have to do something fun and another kind of atmosphere took two hours a day, three times a week. And he didn't like that either. He was, in old substance abuse terms, we would just say he wasn't ready. Um, if you're experiencing a lot of depression, anxiety, don't go gamble away your emotional pain and get educated. I wanna talk just a little bit uh, about some special populations. Women, um, Women gamblers are more likely to have greater psychological distress. They are more likely to be your pathway to the emotionally vulnerable. They can be in one and three, but they're more likely to fall into two. They're likely to have experienced childhood abuse, be unemployed. They are more likely to seek treatment than the males. They also like games that they can escape with, such as slot machines. Um, something that they don't, it doesn't involve others like at a table game. Men have greater impulsivity. They have higher rates of substance abuse. They are less likely to seek treatment and they prefer games that they consider games of skill. Women like to use gambling as a social outlet and it, it satisfies a need to escape. It gives them feelings of empowerment away from traditional caregiver roles. And I think more and more we're seeing that when women are sandwiched between care for children and care for parents who are living longer. And they're burdened with all this caregiving and I can go to a gambling whatever, wherever, and just completely escape. Um, Women have more disposable income than they used to, so you know they can go do that. I recommend a book since we've talked about the correlation with smoking and gambling, and it's it's a real quick read. It's called Nicotine Dreams. The author is Katie Cunningham, and she talked about getting involved in gambling because she wanted a safe place that she could go and smoke. Look at women who have been abused physically, sexually, emotionally, psychologically because gambling will also provide a temporary escape from that. Um, you may have to process grief and loss issues with them. They will have a lot of repressed anger, guilt, shame, fear, depression. Um, gambling venues, if they're gambling outside of the home, are usually very safe. We've got a security person here from gambling venue. They're very safe, so it's they can go there alone and not worry about somebody bothering them. There's not probably going to be predators around. Older gamblers growing exponentially. Um, older gamblers are the livelihood of the gambling industry. They will send buses to senior citizen centers, senior communities like in Florida. Uh, they will send buses there to pick up people, take them to the casino, give them free play, give them free lunch, and then not take them home for eight hours. They often, uh, a large Asian population has a high rate of gambling addiction. They will do that too when you go to New York, large, large cities that will take them to gambling venues and then keep them there for hours at a time. So I, I, if I see someone who is Asian, Asian American, that's something that I always think about is, is this person, does this person have a, a gambling problem? Um, one study found that seniors 65 and older preferred gambling and bingo to movies, lunches, and other social activities. 80% of olders, older adults are looking for entertainment and enjoyment, and they gamble to detract themselves from their everyday problems and from boredom. It's a popular activity amongst all older individuals of all, not all older individuals, older individuals of all cultures. Um, they see it as a form of 
form of harmless entertainment until they start getting in trouble with it. Gambling is the main behavioral addiction in older people. When I say older people, probably the cutoff is going to be 60, 65. For older people, though, it creates a lot of serious harm in the way of financial. They can't, they don't have 20 years to recoup losses. Uh, social, because they are hurting so bad socially, if you stop them from going to a, a casino, for instance, where are they going to get their fun? In Eastern Kentucky, we have a lot of bingo parlors where these little old ladies go, and that's their socialization. And they're many times living on fixed incomes and don't have the money that they can go and gamble. It also can be harm for the family if, you know, they're expecting granny to leave you a big sum of money and she's gambled it away and you find that out. It can be a lot of, a lot of issues within the family. Um, the risk of suicide is especially high for older gamblers. And they don't like really difficult games that you've got to think about and plan and research. They like non-strategic games, something that's real simple. Adolescents, I've talked about several different times, 45%, four to 5% of youth, 12 to 17 meet one or more criteria. And 10 to 14% are at risk of developing a gambling addiction. 60 to 80% of high school kids have gambled for money during the past year. I think that's an incredible statistic. We have started asking a few questions about gambling on the KIPP survey. So if you're familiar with that, you can see the data that they have. Legal gambling is at least 18 and in a few states it's 21, but most kids have gambled by the uh, something by the age of 15. It is so widespread that teens see gambling as normal and part of an everyday life. They're used to opening up that phone, that computer, and see internet, video games, and all the applications. I'm not even going to begin to talk about the issues that are associated with video gaming and teens. I, there is a certification available if you're interested in becoming a certified gaming counselor. Jeremy on our board is our expert in gaming, and he sends my head spinning when he starts to talk. Signs of teenage gaming, gambling involve um, beginning to sell their personal stuff, needing to borrow money, uh, stealing and lying. Parents need to watch out for uh, if they see IOUs if they run into any gambling paraphernalia, strange calls coming into the home. Parents need to be involved with their kids. We know that for many, many reasons, not just for gambling. Parents of teenagers in here, think about the family's attitude towards gambling. Do you occasionally go to the racetrack? Do you go to a, a casino? Will you, are you excited that the historical horse racing is coming to town and, you plan to go there. How often do we as adults use language like, I bet you can't do whatever. It becomes very commonplace. Sitting up here this morning, I caught myself saying, I bet. It's just something we're, we just don't think about. And talk to your kids about screen time and how much time they're on those screens. Uh, the whole idea of video gaming which does involve some gambling and some exchange of money is scary when you get into that. Um, get the opportunity from time to time, we'll bring gaming experts into the, the council's uh, conference and you can hear from them. Trauma and gambling. People with disordered gambling tend to have a high rate of trauma, uh, higher than the general population. I mentioned intimate partner of violence is very, very big. Um, child abuse and neglect. Here's the study about neglect. And this was done in South Africa in 2020. Childhood trauma predicts a diagnosis of gambling disorder. More severe trauma, the greater the disassociation and gambling severity. And physical neglect is the number one childhood trauma that increase the odds of gambling. 
So when you're doing your screenings, look for that phys physical, emotional neglect. Trauma and gambling relate because it's a, it's a matter of escape, disassociating from things. People with both problems are more likely to seek treatment for their gambling than for their trauma because they perceive the presenting problem more urgent. So they're going to seek treatment for their gambling more than their trauma. Unless a person discloses their history of trauma, it's difficult to discern survivors from non-survivors. If someone's coming into you for gambling, you need to assess them for trauma as well. Um, they're going to have more severe gambling problems. They're going to have more severe mental health problems, substance abuse problems, so forth. These are your pathway two and three people when they have large amounts of trauma. Intimate partner violence. Um, you can see the statistics on here. I do want to mention within G uh, Gamblers Anonymous is what we call a pressure relief meeting. These pressure relief meetings are where you kind of tighten up the finances and figure out a way to start repayment. Uh, and this happens, you know, you, you, in GA members are called trusted servants, not just members like they are in AA. But these trusted servants will meet with you and usually your spouse or significant other. They will restructure, look at, figure out a repayment plan for everything, and then they're going <clears> to <throat> look at most likely that person that's there with them, the significant other <coughs> or the spouse, and say, you're in charge of the finances. And you negotiate how much cash the gambler can have on them at any given time and kind of you know, really get tight around this. And I've interviewed too many women to, who have said, if I have control of the money and he wants to go gamble and I tell him no, I'm going to be hurt. So you've got to really take a look at that. And the same thing, if, even if you're not sending them to GA and GA doing pressure relief, you as the counselor, <laughs> this is not something we're taught in graduate school. We don't do a lot of stuff with finances. That's numbers who <laughs> don't want to do numbers. That's why we went into social service stuff, because we didn't like math, right? It was one of, the, one of the reasons. But you're going to have to help them with their finances. And again, if you recommend to the partner that may be there with them to take over their finances, be very aware of setting that person up for potentially getting harmed. Talked uh, earlier, I mentioned bets with PTSD. They have a higher risk to become um, disordered gamblers. Their rates of suicide are much higher, even upwards of 60%. And they may have uh, difficulty finding treatment. It's not always available. There is that secrecy in, in the military. Um, they are probably going to have pretty good amount of alcohol use as well. Um, it says 13% of those with, that are gambling also have PTSD, so be aware. I know uh, I have not had the opportunity to treat a lot of veterans, but it is it's always very interesting when you have them because of the amount of secrecy that goes on with them. Why involve the family? They don't have a problem, or do they? Yes, they do. They have become victim, victims of the uh, individual's gambling, their gambling addiction, and they have developed a lot of not real good coping skills to deal with that gambler in the family. So you can look at those statistics. I'm trying to hurry through, and you've got this, this uh, PowerPoint in your uh, packet. This is a chart that shows what's going on with first column is uh, emotional, physical, or behavioral difficulties. The second column is what's going on with the partner in each of those categories. Then what's going on with the children. The children in gambling families are often the forgotten victims. 
and we need to change that. It's critical to involve the family in the recovery of a gambler. Um, I have a person now that I'm treating who has their spouse accompanies them, has accompanied them to all but one session. But if the spouse is seeing problems, the spouse calls me between sessions. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how that unfolds. Individual success is less likely if the person's relationships are not taken into account. So you've got to work with that family, if at all possible, if you have someone who's gambling, get the family members in there. It's important to gain their perspective. I wrote this down yesterday when Dr. Fong was talking about families. He said affected individuals, meaning the family, respond well with treatment but present at rates of, you get four gamblers to every one family member. So they're tired. They're tired of them, just like substance abuse. And lastly, the good news is recovery is possible. The majority of persons treated for gambling reduce their gambling behaviors. Psychiatric distress and symptoms decrease markedly with gambling treatment. We know how to be effective in working with them, but you need all this training to do it. Gambling treatment clients who commit illegal acts support their, to support their gambling respond as well as those who don't commit acts. That's kind of the comeback of, do they do better if they're court ordered or not? It doesn't matter, both do very well. 75% of those treated will reduce their gambling behaviors. When you're providing treatment, look at mind, body, spirit, and a, as a continuum. Consider harm reduction. Maybe you'll have better luck than I did. Talk about relapse prevention, and you gotta learn some stuff about financial counseling. Currently, there is no approved drug for the treatment of gambling disorders. Some of the antidepressants, Prozac, Luvox, and the Zoloft may help. Some individuals report some good luck with naltrexone, which is used in treatment of alcohol and opiate disorders. And we've seen some, it's still early, but some positive results. I'm gonna say it again, CBT seems to be the best way to go. Use of mindfulness and teaching mindfulness techniques seems to be really well, as does motivational interviewing. I want to leave you with one quote from the famous Joanna Franklin. She was a pioneer and the expert and an expert in, in leading gambling research and gambling treatment. And she said, always remember, this is a chronic, recurring, and manageable disorder. Treatment is available. Treatment can work. I wish you luck with this population. They're fun to work with. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalind. Uh, on behalf of the Kentucky Council on Problem Gambling, I would like to offer you this little gift. Thank you, Thank you so much. Appreciate it. If you have um, any questions, I'll be around to take them. Or if you want to come up here and ask any questions. Chester, I'm here. Do you have I'm Curtis Barrett, uh, for the record here. And uh, mine is more a comment than a, a question. For as long as I've been in this field, there's always been an undercurrent discussion and, and really challenge to those of us who are in the field and that boils down to the question of is gamble, gam, disordered gambling, as we call it now, is it truly an addiction or is it something else? Is it a social problem or who knows what else? Is it an economic problem? And uh, I want to uh, just raise a point that's developed, uh, among others, by a friend of mine out in Oklahoma. And he says from his research that the definition of addiction 
uh, hinges on whether there is craving. And his position is no craving, no addiction. It's something else. And I think this is something that Mike Townsend has lived with for his entire career as we try to uh, influence the public, influence businesses, that we are actually dealing not just with a problem, but with an addiction. So I think one of the questions that Gambling 101 has to answer, that each of us have to answer as professionals, is are we really dealing with an addiction? What's the evidence for that? And how good is that evidence? And we know that the American Psychiatric Association has certainly uh, struggled with even the idea of addiction, whether that's a viable concept in itself. And so it's, it's something that's before us, I think, all of the time.